Hello and welcome back boys, girls and So I very recently played the campaigns of all 6 Halo games included in the Master Chief collection for the first time and I have a lot to say about each one. In fact, I was planning to make a video where I reviewed all 6 of them back to back but it was going to take too much time and effort that way for one video so I decided to split them up into their own videos. Now I usually don't review such old games on this channel as Combat Evolved and even said in my last review that I think we should stop making so many Silent Hill 2 retrospectives and seek out newer titles that are worth putting a spotlight on. Not because these older games or any older media for that matter that have gained their legendary status are not worth being talked about or because I dislike them of course. I think we can all agree that Evangelion is pretty rad and we can keep dissecting its themes for years to come. But you see, Combat Evolved was not like any of these older media that I have only gotten around to seeing what they're all about recently. I think that the original RE4 could be the best comparison to make here since I also played that for the first time this year, right before Halo CE in fact. And since both of these games ended up being revolutionary for different but similar reasons. Whereas RE4 gave us the over the shoulder aiming system that every third person shooter after it copied, Combat Evolved did the same for all kinds of games on consoles with its left stick for movement, right stick for camera deal, popularizing first person shooters on these systems for years to come. But whereas RE4 was an extremely fun roller coaster for me all the way through with its never ending ridiculous set pieces, over the top characters and goofy dialogue, Combat Evolved felt more like an uneventful bus trip where there were some cool sights to see at first but then we rode into the desert where like 60% of the trip took place and there was also no AC so it didn't take long for me to start begging for it to just end. Now before you click dislike, unsubscribe and leave the video so that you won't have to hear another word that comes out of my putrid fucking mouth, allow me to say that there are quite a few things that I like about this game which we're going to talk about. However, I can say that the game holds up really well overall when you get into it in current year like me with no prior nostalgia. And a lot of fans seem to think otherwise or at least that's the sort of message I get from their reasons for loving this game. I do share some of the same love for certain parts of this game but a lot of other parts of it feel either unremarkable or poorly aged for me today. I understand why they were all loud or at least not hated when the game came out but although it could have deserved to be called a masterpiece in 2001 where I disagree with seemingly a lot of people out there is that it has aged like wine. There is surely an attempt by 343 to make the game at least look and sound more modern with the anniversary edition but even these changes come with their own problems where they would only enhance the experience in an ideal world. So I want to start with these changes before I get into anything else since I don't want people to keep telling me it's just because of the anniversary edition that I don't like the game much and I also don't want people unfamiliar with Halo to be confused since there will be both the anniversary edition graphics and the original graphics shown on the video. Firstly, contrary to some takes I have seen regarding the new visuals, I don't think they look worse than the original as a whole necessarily. I actually prefer the added detail at most places, especially the outdoor sections that take place during the day. I've seen some complaints that they make it harder for the player to distinguish the covenant troops from the terrain as with the original visuals their colors contrast the terrain more and make them stand out. However, while this is true, I think the issue is a bit overblown. Yes, the colors contract each other less with the anniversary graphics but I never really had a hard time making out the enemies from the environment. They still stand out to a sufficient degree if you ask me. But I agree that it could have been better if they stood out as much as they did in the original version since it takes away some accessibility from the game that was already there from the get-go. Think about all the players that could be visually impaired in some way and thus have a genuinely hard time making out where the enemies are. Yes, you can switch back and forth between the original original and anniversary graphics anytime you want, but it doesn't help that the game starts you off with the anniversary graphics by default without asking you what you want and doesn't even tell you that there is an option to play the game with the old graphics, let alone tell you how to do so. Ignoring the obvious option of asking the internet, you can either discover that there's such an option by seeing it all the way at the bottom in the keybind configurations or by accidentally pressing tab during a level and suddenly being jump scared by 2001, which is what happened to me. But 
But that's only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the issues with the anniversary graphics. Perhaps the biggest offender, as it affects a much bigger portion of the game, is how bright everything is compared to when you have the original graphics on. This is such an appalling design decision as it makes the whole goddamn mechanic of the game, your flashlight, and the night vision of your sniper rifle completely unnecessary. I was switching back and forth between the original and anniversary graphics while recording this footage to be able to show all the different parts of the game in both visual styles, and at some point where I had the sniper rifle in a well-lit section of the game, I switched from the OG graphics to the anniversary ones which made everything even more lit, and forgetting that I had left the night vision of my scope on which would make everything even brighter if I were to use it, I attempted to aim my rifle and ended up getting absolutely blasted by the light of Allah. There's also the issues this creates for the game's atmosphere. I do enjoy the look of these hyper-futuristic environments of the Forerunner and Covenant structures in the Anniversary Edition just as much as I like their mysterious and alien design that comes with the less is more approach of the simplistic OG graphics. However, certain levels where darkness and the use of your flashlight or night vision is clearly supposed to add to the overall atmosphere like the first half of Truth and Reconciliation or the entirety of 343 Guilty Spark suffer immensely because of the overwhelming brightness and thus end up offering a straight up inferior experience with the Anniversary graphics. The problems continue with the Hunters in the Anniversary Edition as their ranged attacks are clearly and sufficiently telegraphed when you're playing with the OG graphics, while such a telegraph is nowhere to be found with the Anniversary graphics. And last but not least, as a middle finger to the players that prefer to play with the original graphics because they don't want to deal with these issues, the new terminals added in the Anniversary Edition are only noticeable and accessible if you're playing with the Anniversary graphics. This last one honestly feels borderline criminal, not only hiding the new collectibles but also restricting the player from picking them up if they don't want to play the game with your new graphics. When this is combined with the fact that it is so hard to find how to access the older graphics in the first place, it just begins to feel like 343 or whoever made these decisions had a personal vendetta against Bungie. And this is probably the case since not only does Bungie's name never appear anywhere, whether it be the opening credits of the Master Chief Collection as a whole or the opening credits of any individual game, but their heartfelt goodbye message to the fans at the end of Halo Reach is also removed, while 343's message thanking the fans for entrusting the franchise to them at the end of Halo 4 remains intact. Not only that, but the end credits of each game is also nowhere to be found. The only credits that can be found are accessed from the extras menu and those also don't list Bungie for anything in any way. Basically everything that referenced the studio that brought 5 of the 6 games here to life in the first place, games that are so special to a majority of the player base coming back after all these years to relieve these games that are an important part of their childhoods is removed. Look, I know business is business and that Bungie had no hand in making MCC or the PC ports etc, but I still can't help but feel that it's all a bit scummy. But enough with 343 and their anniversary changes, let's get into the real meat of the video, the game itself. And let's start with the positives as it's fitting for this game since its first half is definitely its strongest part. While some elements of it like weapon variety may feel bare bones by today's standards, there is nothing here during these first 5 levels that feels frustrating except maybe for the latter half of the 5th level getting somewhat repetitive. Everything else though either holds up well enough or exceeds my expectations set by modern games. The latter is of course a compliment to the enemy AI. Many other shooters I can think of which are all newer than this one are filled with enemies that just stand out in the open to get shot or stick to one cover from which they pop out their heads in regular intervals for you to shoot with ease. This game on the other hand, despite being more than 2 decades old at this point, puts them to shame with the Covenant, and especially the elites. They run from cover to cover instead of sticking to one, try to dodge your shots when out in the open, circle around objects to catch or avoid you, and run at you for a melee strike when you get too close while they're on the defensive, or when they get close while you're on the defensive. And their behavior is only enhanced by the rest of the Covenant troops around them. While the unrelenting plasma rifle shots of the elites keep you at bay, Jekylls put the pressure on you from a closer range with their shields along with the seemingly weak grunts that can still fuck you up with a single grenade if you aren't paying attention. The grunts also run away in panic by the way if you take down the more powerful enemies first since you have just slain their commanders and they don't know what to do. Not only do all of these enemies have a specific purpose that just works so well with each other and the battle arenas that they are put in, but every move, animation and even sound that they make is either smart or has so much character, usually both. In almost every other shooter 
encounter I played before, the enemies that made themselves memorable to me were just the bosses or maybe some special rare mini boss type enemies here and there, while everything else felt like fodder. There are exceptions of course like Doom's diverse entourage of demons, but I'd be lying if I said I was expecting the covenant as a whole to grow on me this much. Forget about shooters, this enemy faction has to be one of my favorites in any game ever period, especially after playing Halo 2 and 3, but we'll get to those in later videos. It's not just how it uses its enemies that I have to praise about the game though, but also how it uses your allies. They can be surprisingly useful, drawing the enemy's fire and even killing some of them for you instead of just being there animated like they're shooting the general direction of the enemy without actually doing anything to give you the illusion of fighting alongside them rather than the experience. And they even become more useful when the Warthog is introduced as a vehicle that can break through enemy lines and shred them all to dust but only with the cooperation of multiple people. I could easily see a game from this era introduce a quote unquote Warthog section where you get inside one of these and it's just a turret section as the Warthog just goes from one point to the other in a scripted sequence, as many games after this one have done. Sections like these do have their place and I don't hate them necessarily, but I definitely prefer when they are a fully fleshed out part of the core gameplay like this, so that I can drive the Warthog if I want, or control its turret, or hell even get into the passenger seat and shoot my gun if I see fit while my allies fill in the other roles, and if any of them dies, I can find new allies to fill in their spot. It helps even further that it's not just you or your allies still being vulnerable while in the Warthog, but the Warthog itself also being highly susceptible to getting fucking wrecked if you get too cocky or careless. You may not care about getting shot by a few enemies here and there inside your hog of destruction, but drive yourself into an army of them or into a plasma grenade and you're more dead than my hopes for a new infamous game. I know all of this doesn't sound too impressive in today's day and age, but it is still one of the aspects of the game that has aged quite well I'd say. Maybe except for the driving controls themselves as you can only go forward towards where you're looking at or backwards. Basically what I'm trying to say is that there's no turning without also turning the camera which kind of sucks, but this doesn't take much away from the experience all things considered. What's more is that other vehicles such as the speeders of the Covenant known as Ghosts allow you to both drive and shoot at the same time if that's what you want, and all of these vehicles can be operated by you, the enemies or the allies during an all out conflict, constantly changing hands as their drivers are shot by the opposing side and then taken over. All of these things just make these vehicles such natural extensions of the existing gameplay mechanics instead of one and done deals for a level. And even the vehicles that are one and done deals like the scorpion tank in assault on the control room are just there for you to pilot freely and in full control. Hell, you can even ignore it altogether if you want and go through the level with just warthogs and ghosts. There's a lot of room for player expression with both the weapon and vehicle choices and the openness of the combat arenas. Speaking of those combat arenas, while they may seem unremarkable by today's standards, the verticality and openness they present complement the Covenant very well, allowing all the grunts, jackals and elites to flank you or shoot you from above and below simultaneously while one of them rushes to you with an energy sword, leading to really tense yet fun encounters. However, while the game's level design shines on the smaller scale thanks to these arenas, it is a bit more of a mixed bag on the larger scale. I've seen a lot of praise for how some missions like Halo and the Silent Cartographer are laid out, having large non-linear sections of exploration where the mission landmarks can be visited in any order. And while I'm sure that these sections felt pretty novel as a whole in 2001 and stood out from the other levels, to me it just kind of felt like giving the player that feeling was the only goal. It feels like openness just for the sake of openness, since not only is there almost nothing to see besides where your objectives are anyway, but in which order you visit them doesn't really matter either. So I actually think that making these missions in particular more linear or adding more things in between the objectives could have been a lot better in order to not kill the pace. Maybe some more combat, maybe some more collectibles that aren't just ammo and health that you find around the objective landmarks anyway, or maybe some more easter eggs. Look, I know I'm going to get massacred for this by the fans but I have to say it. This game isn't really that fun to play when things aren't happening. I didn't find there to be any amazing sights to see or an amazing atmosphere or amazing dialogue to listen to or anything worth taking a breather for with either graphics option. And yes, that does include 343 Guilty Spark but we're going to come back to that one later. The combat is honestly what makes this game for me and it's even better when it's vehicle combat. And so for these two levels what I think they could have done would be connecting the objectives in a linear fashion but keep the option of going through them with your war 
talk or make more enemies appear on the map in between the objective spots when you complete one. Make some dropships, land more troops or send in some banshees or introduce ghosts a level earlier, I don't know. All I'm trying to say is that I would have much preferred driving my Warthog through something like the vehicle section of Assault on the control room that I just praise so much even if it's linear, rather than an open island where some enemies are scattered here and there and they don't reappear once you slay them. Speaking of Assault on the control room, I want to clarify that everything besides the very few criticisms that I have just laid out up to this level still feels perfect. The introduction of each new gameplay element is paced really well. The first level teaches the basics, then the second level greatly opens up the map and introduces more enemies and the warthog, the third level introduces stealth, more weapons and even more enemies and so on until all of these things are put to display at once in this great fifth level. Both with its on foot sections where all the weapons you've learned to use throughout the first four levels coming into play and with its all out vehicle sections involving warthogs, banshees, ghosts and the tanks of each side in this massive battle. Hunters, jackals, grunts and all types of elites just don't stop coming whether you're inside a beefy ass tank or fully exposed. It is true that even the best aspects of this game that put your average modern titles to shame like the AI, the Covenant and how your allies are utilized may not be things that will blow your mind away completely by themselves. But what's really special is when they all come together in a level like this. Combat Evolves gameplay is better than the sum of its parts and that's what makes Assault on the Control Room my favorite level in the game despite a few issues with its later parts that I'm going to touch on and it's a shame that not only do none of the levels after it reach the same heights that it reaches but most of them suffer from the same issues as well. What I'm talking about is once again the level design but this time due to the opposite reasons than those needlessly open levels that I discussed. This time starting by the last parts of Assault on the Control Room, the same combat arenas, although very well designed themselves, start appearing over and over until it feels like it's never going to end. And this is not only disappointing by itself, but it is also completely unnecessary if the goal was to increase the length of the level, because it is already just as long as the previous ones without this string of arenas at the end anyway. All this does is make the level overstay its welcome in the worst way possible in my opinion, and unfortunately, it only gets worse from here. Level 6 343 Guilty Spark is all about creating this tense and mysterious atmosphere as you walk by the aftermath of a battle you haven't participated in that has left both your allies and the Covenant troops either dead or completely terrified to the degree that they can't even recount what they've just witnessed so you have to go see it for yourself. I played this level with the anniversary graphics at first which are horrible for creating the atmosphere that the game is going for throughout this section but I was still intrigued as to what could possibly be in store for me. The game alerts this new mysterious threat at the end of the previous level and then spends all this time building it up so naturally I was pretty pumped to see what it had in store for me considering how much fun the previous levels had been. And finally after all this anticipation through both environmental storytelling and cutscenes here comes the reveal. <laughs> They're fucking headcrab zombies. Look, I'm really happy for you if your jaw dropped when you saw this twist for the first time when you were a kid or whatever, but you can't expect me to get hyped for this shit in 2023. I'll be blunt, I don't like the flood and nor do I like this level. And after replaying it with the old graphics as well, I can say that while they do somewhat improve the atmosphere both before and after the reveal, it is still not nearly enough for me to get excited for the game effectively pushing my beloved covenant aside and telling me to fight fucking zombie whores that do the exact things I was complaining moments ago about poor enemy AI. They either mindlessly charge at you to eat all your shotgun shells or stand still in the distance to eat your pistol rounds. The game naturally becomes way easier than when you were fighting ghosts that can run you over and elites that can run from cover to cover, be fucking invisible and use energy swords and grenades and shit. It is especially disappointing to me because just look at the forest section of this level. It is so open with several trees and hills around to take cover behind, I would have loved to fight against some elites or hunters in this place instead of fighting the flood. Yes, the flood can carry weapons at least, so they're a bit above your classic zombies I suppose, but they're still miles below the covenant as competent enemies, since their behavior is still just as basic as I described even with those weapons. And to compensate for their lack of brain power, the game tries to fix this issue by sending large numbers of these fuckers at you wave after wave for 2 hours in the next level. The library. Oh boy. Let me tell you about the 
fucking library. If assault on the control room is like eating an amazing gourmet burger for me, then 343 Guilty Spark is like eating a day old McChicken. And the library is like chugging rat poison with a side of metal dust. If there are a million library haters in the world, I'm one of them. If there are 100 library haters in the world, I'm one of them. If there is one library hater in the world, I'm him. If there are no library haters in the world, then I finally fragged myself in a corner due to not being able to bear the memory of ever playing the library. If Delhiham is an affront to God, this level is an affront to human rights. If I was Satan, I would ask for a signed autograph of the person who designed this level and hang it on the wall of my throne room in the darkest, deepest pit of hell. You get the point. 343 Guilty Spark is a downgrade for me from the previous missions with its worst enemies and the issue of repetitive combat arenas continuing to be a thing after those enemies are introduced, but it still has its merits like a great build up towards the reveal. The library on the other hand only takes the worst aspects of Guilty Spark and amplifies them by 20 while making the level twice as long also. For those of you that don't know, this level takes place in a 4 story tower where each floor is the exact same. The same empty rooms and narrow tunnels back to back with constant waves of flood and nothing else that was good from the previous levels. No vehicles, no allies except for these lifeless drones that sometimes come around and shoot lasers, no Cortana, no Covenant, no fucking verticality in any of the rooms unless you count these little bumps that one or two zombies out of 200 may occasionally use. Fucking nothing but you and the worst thing about the game in a string of empty copy paste rooms and don't give me that oh but the enemy waves change during the level bullshit either. Wow there are 8 pistol zombies and 3 shotgun zombies in this wave. In the last one there was 5 of each. Amazing fucking variety. It's not like all of them behave the same fucking way and that I'm in wave 35 probably with still another floor I have to go through. You know after floor 2 I was guessing that the game was going to let me out of the tower and send me to do something else. Or at the very least the next floor was going to be different maybe. And then after another iteration of the same shit I was telling myself that there's no way there's a fourth floor. And yet there it was and it was still the same shit. I don't know how I didn't go insane playing this level. It is so horrendously awful and repetitive from start to finish and to say that it overstays its welcome is the understatement of the century. But I think I ranted about these two levels and the flood for long enough. So let's wrap up this game by finally talking about the last three levels. These levels are thankfully much better compared to 343 Guilty Spark and the library, but they are still somewhat worse than the first half of the game for me. To list the positives, the Covenant is back at full force with their elites and banshees and stuff. And because the flood is also here as a third faction, it is actually kind of neat to see them fight against each other and once again, it is quality game design that this fighting takes place during gameplay among actual enemies on the battlefield instead of scripted sequences. This means that when you see a bunch of flood and covenant troops at each other's throats, you can make decisions according to the situation and on your own strategy. You can wait for the conflict to end so you can pick off the few remaining survivors easily for instance be it the flood or the covenant. Or you can make sure one side gets eliminated first without leaving it to chance or say fuck it and just blast whoever you come across based on stuff like what weapons you have since certain weapons are effective in certain situations and against certain enemies. Another positive aspect of the game that gets to shine more once the flood and the sentinel drones are introduced that somewhat makes up for their presence. Vehicles are back as well for one last time in mission 8 although it is kind of frustrating that you have to use banshees since I hate how they control but at least those sections are relatively short. What's not short though is the level itself as it is yet another one that overstays its welcome if you ask me. Not only by repetitive level design since it is just assault on the control room backwards but also with repetitive objectives. Really it would be as easy as making it so that you only have to disable two pulse generators rather than three for this level for it to be much better if you ask me. The ninth level also has mostly the same map as that of a previous one but at least it doesn't drag on for as long as eight does. And finally the last level takes place in the same location as the first one but it's actually not that similar to it especially with its final arena and war talk section which does end the game on a high note especially with the main team in the background as you're driving through all the ramps and explosions I'll admit. Overall these levels do feel like a breath of fresh air after the god forsaken library and everything that was great about the game in the first half does somewhat find a chance to shine once more. And although they are mostly just some older levels on reverse, the enemies being different and fighting among themselves do freshen things up a little and the flood is not that annoying when you're not fighting them inside the library and the covenant is also around. But it doesn't 
change the fact that they could have been a much better enemy faction or that the covenant could have been expanded instead with more types of troops or that the game could have just fucking chilled with the amount of zombies it throws at you at a lot of points. It doesn't become hard as they keep coming, it just becomes annoying. It is also kind of sad to not see any allies at your side anymore once you're out of the library. It seems that all the humans have either fled or been slain by one of the remaining enemy factions. But I guess it makes sense for the story that it's all up to Master Chief now to save the day and for everything to end where it all started. So going through these levels again but this time with the humans driven back and the flood loose is thematically appropriate for the narrative. And speaking of that narrative, I guess it's the one thing that I have not talked about. And I mean, it's fine, there's not much of it anyway and it's nothing that I have a strong opinion about necessarily. Overall it's serviceable, nothing great or terrible compared to most things in the game that leans on either one of those sides. The terminals they've added in the anniversary edition do expand upon the story quite a bit though and some of them like the one where keys is being absorbed into the flood high mind thing are really good. And it was a good idea to make them optional collectibles since they could have dragged the cutscenes of the main story for way too long if they were integrated into those. But besides them there's not much I can say about the story other than it gets the job done and sets up the universe and its lore quite well for future sequels to expand upon. And with that being said let's wrap up this video with my final thoughts on Combat Evolved. Look I really appreciate this game overall. I appreciate what it did for the medium and for also starting this franchise which really grabbed me with the next games we're going to talk about in the upcoming videos. There are some really great things here as I mentioned, not only for their time but in general. But considering the legendary status of a title like this, I was really expecting a bit more I guess than 5 great levels, then a disappointing one, then a horrendous one and then 3 okay ones. Like I was not having a good time with the second half of this game. The immensely inferior enemy faction taking over most of the spotlight, the level design quality slowly decreasing through levels 5, 6 and 7 and then taking a shortcut with the rest and the lack of any human allies really tested my patience as the levels began feeling a lot longer too. So I guess that's pretty much how I feel about Combat Evolved. A very promising experience yet one that was ultimately disappointing for me. But thankfully its sequels more than made up for that. And that's why I would still recommend this game for anyone that's interested in the franchise. Although I didn't like this one as much as the other games in the collection, it's still not a bad game overall and I think it's worth playing to see where and how the series laid its foundations to truly appreciate how the sequels expand upon what's here. And of course everyone knows the proper etiquette when it comes to stuff like this. Just don't be a filthy part skipper okay? Yes the series gets good at Halo 2 but Combat Evolved is an essential and important part of this series that makes Halo 2 even better. So behave yourself. Anyways I hope you enjoyed this video and I really hope that if you played this game you enjoyed it more than I did. And if you're still mad that I didn't enjoy it as much as you did and unsure about whether you should unsub or not then at least let me tell you that the remaining videos are going to be a lot more positive. Especially the very next one because I love Halo 2 if you can't tell. It was probably my favorite game in this whole collection so I'm really excited to talk about it. But until then take care of yourselves and I hope to see you all in the next video. Thank you for watching.